everyone. Thank you for joining us for this, our 65th episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. And um, for those of you who join us regularly, you might notice that instead of my usual bookcases um, in my home office, I have a blurred background today because I am actually in Old Greenwich, Connecticut for the Ephemera Society of America conference and fair. Um, I appreciate that Zoom allows me to stay connected while I'm traveling and that we get to interact with friends from all across the world as well. If people aren't able to join us, however, we do record the program to share online later. And this afternoon, you will receive um, an email with the recording and resources mentioned in today's broadcast. Broadcast. There we go. Just in case you are joining us for the first time or need a reminder, um, we use Zoom in a way that we think of as very um, collaborative. We'd love for you to participate in the chat, change the setting to everyone. Um, and if you have a question for um, Jane today, please put that in the Q&A section. That allows us to keep them all together. And if you see a question that you're interested um, in hearing more about as well, you can give it a thumbs up and that upvotes the question and gives us an idea of the order of the questions in case we have a lot of them. We do have the li live machine captioning turned on today uh, as part of our diversity, equity and inclusion program. So. Uh, play around with that. You can toggle it on or off or change the side of the font. And I can only control so much of what you see. So uh, play around with your screen. I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled so that you should be able to adjust the relative size of the speaker and the slides that you're seeing. Um, my colleagues, Ann Bennington Helper and Helen Harding, will be monitoring the chat and pasting uh, helpful links in as we go along. But those links will also be included later today when we send out the email. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library's mission is to collect, preserve, share, and promote the study and discussion of primary sources related to all aspects of history and culture of North America and the Caribbean to about 1900. So we'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Badawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabe ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. If you haven't had a chance yet to participate in our poll, quick, click, um, and then I'm going to uh, end the poll and share the results. So, um, I think, Jane, this is probably about what we expected. Uh, mm -hmm. So, 
this this does help us and and you know certainly part of what we see is all of the um uh during women's history month the kids are certainly in school learning about the top two in a in a very regular manner so uh Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this poll and for joining us today to learn more about Emily Howland. I'm excited to be joined by my colleague, Jane Ptolemy. Uh, she is the Associate Curator of Manuscripts and has been with the Clements since 2013. Jane completed her Bachelor of Arts degree at Albion College with a major in history and a concentration in ethnic studies, and also holds a, P, a dual PhD in history and African American studies from Yale University. Um, in celebration of Women's History Month, we will explore a recently acquired collection that Jane Jane has been working with here at the Clemens Library. So welcome, Jane. I'm excited to have you on the program. I'm excited to be here. I've been just waiting for the opportunity to geek out with people about this collection. So this is a real thrill for me and, and a real note of thanks for holding the space and, and, and looking at this collection together. Yes, I, thank you. Yeah, so please go ahead and share your screen. And um, as we uh, get started, I'll note, uh, um, you know, uh, as we had had just that poll question as well, that I remember that when we were first discussing making this acquisition that I had to ask who Emily Howland was. And so I'm sure that, um, as noted in, in the poll, many are not yet ac acquainted with her. And so I'm excited to have you uh, give this talk today. And I know you'll begin with a, a great introduction to this remarkable woman. Yeah, Angela, and like just like you and the some 70% of the folks on this call right now, I hadn't really heard of Emily Howland prior to last year either. Um, but she was an extraordinary woman who lived until the age of 101. She lived through the abolition of slavery, through reconstruction, the passage of the 19th amendment that gave women the right to vote, as well as the devastation of World War I. Um, she helped found schools for African-Americans in the South following the Civil War and made significant financial contributions to some 50 black educational institutions. She was a vocal advocate for women's suffrage. She organized events, attended conventions, wrote some pointed letters to politicians. She put her money where her mouth was, and she fostered some really close friendships with others in the movement. She also was one of the first female directors of a national bank, because why not? And she was an activist and reformer who dedicated herself to social change and justice as she understood it. And she spent her whole life uh, deeply engaged in advocacy work, but I knew nothing about her. And I mean, I get it. Classroom time is limited and she just isn't the name that gets floated as the representative example. As we saw in the poll, some figures are just more well-known than others, and that exposure starts really early. With it being Women's History Month, I've been looking for books to read with my seven-year-old son, and you'll notice that title after title after title really kind of forefront Susan B. Anthony. But searching my local public library, none of them, I could find none that shared Emily Howland's story. So it's not unexpected that even in this group of total history nerds, she's still relatively unknown. But last year, that changed for me when these three boxes arrived on our doorstep containing an amazing manuscript collection that documents Howland's life and labors that had been consigned to an antiquarian dealer. Opening the boxes, the excitement was palpable in the room. We knew from the beginning this was an important acquisition. 
the library's collections continue to grow every every day, every week, and we try to be really delib deliberate to intentionally build a broader, more diverse material base that helps us better understand the nuances of the American past. And we knew that this collection would significantly contribute to how we could support research and learning on women's intellectual and public lives. But like with most things that happen here at the library, I wanted to begin carefully and slowly and take time to notice and observe from the very beginning. So it wasn't lost on me that there was newspaper coverage of Black women's protest over police violence amidst the packing supplies for the, the collection, or that the co-signer who sold the collection shared that they were dedicated to using the proceeds of the sale to fund a social welfare project in the name of a beloved relative and advocate in her own right, Rita Marshall. So I really entered into the project of processing and describing the stunning new collection with a very keen awareness of the ongoing legacy of women's social and political organizing and how interconnected these stories have been over the centuries. I knew that working with Emily Howland's papers and making choices about how to tell her story would require thinking carefully about women's labor, the weight of what we carry, and how we can better advocate for each other now and into the future. Which is to say, I was super geeked to get started. And even that first day when we were taking things out of the boxes for the first time, we were blown away by what the papers were promising to tell us. There were letters, there were photographs and documents, a heavily used diary that was just itching to open, and much more, all reflecting Howland's century-long life and her deep commitment to the social issues that were close to her heart. So let me spend just the next few minutes talking about Emily Howland and what we've learned about her as we think about all the rich stories that we can relish this Women's History Month and beyond. So Howland was born in 1827 in Sherwood, New York, a small town in Cayuga County amidst the Finger Lakes. Her parents were Quakers, they ran a general store, and they were active abolitionists. If you look at maps of Sherwood, New York, you're gonna see the Howland name kind of peppered throughout. If you look closely, you'll see Howland, 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 right? So they were pretty prominent folks um, in a in a already really forward thinking region. Now the family subscribed to anti-slavery publications like the Liberator, the Philanthropist, and the Anti-Slavery Standard, a copy of which is included in the collection. So Howland really grew up surrounded by this literature. She was taken to abolitionist lectures with her siblings, and she saw her family supporting enslaved people fleeing through Sherwood, New York to freedom. Her house was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So it's no surprise that in the collection you find things like this newspaper or this stunning sampling of anti-slavery and agricultural almanacs that people in her orbit were reading, uh, tearing and carefully stitching back together and saving. Or that some of the earliest correspondence in the collection reflects these commitments. This is a letter written in 1851 from one abolitionist in Ontario to another activist trying to coordinate supply deliveries in order to support populations of formerly enslaved people. Now the letter opens noting that they are writing to this person trying to get clothing and barrels of supplies on the advice of their shared correspondent, Emily Howland, who connected these two people invested in the work. Now, Emily at this point would have been just shy of 24 years old, which just blows my mind when I think of what I was doing when I was 24. You know, here she is, she's already stepping deliberately into circles to advance black freedom. In 1857, she began teaching for the first time at the, now, at the Normal School for Colored Girls, founded by Martilla Minor, shown here in the outskirts of Washington, DC. This was one of the first high schools for black women, and it was funded in part from donations by Harriet Beecher Stowe's sales of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Meaning that teaching here was really kind of a statement. And Howland was very clear eyed about her intentions going into it. She wrote just a few months after her arrival at the school, Uncle H is right. I am a fanatic. I know it perfectly well. She felt it was reasonable and necessary to be fanatic in order to counterbalance other people's apathy. 
and working towards a purpose, even if it, it unsettled some people, was all well and good. Her passion for supporting Black education was officially off and running, and this would continue strong through the rest of her life. In her papers, we find this list of scholars naming the students Helen taught in her classroom. Some 30 years later, she's reflecting on her experiences and Howland remembered, quote, I frankly told them why I offered myself as their teacher and of my ignorance of what I had undertaken to do and asked them to cooperate with me in the work in which they ought to be more interested than I. She went on to note that one of the pupils told her long afterwards, she stayed in touch with them, that they discussed me and decided that they would not give me any trouble. So I think this is kind of this really beautiful scene where we sense Emily's sincerity, her openness that she doesn't have any idea what to do as a teacher. She's got no training to teach. She's never done this before. It's her first time in a classroom. And that you can feel the students kind of like assessing her and kind of collectively deciding not to give this poor greenhorn a hard time. But what's really extraordinary about the collection is that as you keep reading and looking, um, you start to find more and more to kind of build out this story. Here's a letter that Howland writes in 1858, again, shortly after she starts teaching, writing back home to her parents, telling of a day trip she organizes to go visit some of her students' families and homes. They include a stop to speak with Aunt Nellie, an older woman who tells them about losing most of her children to the slave trade. Now we learn of this from Howland's perspective, and she includes some really beautiful details, noting the flowers these formerly enslaved people were growing in their gardens. Um, but you can also note and acknowledge some elements of white privilege and prejudice as well that makes her way into her writing. She writes, here for the first time, I saw one of the poor Rachels of whom I had heard my whole life. So she's really telling her parents who had bought her all of this anti-slavery literature, these kind of flattened stories of enslaved people. And you can see her kind of imposing her vision of what uh, an enslaved person is onto somebody else. But as you keep looking though, you also find this piece. Again, this is entitled A Visit to Aunt Nellie. Now this is written by one of the students in the group. Margaret McAnulty, and we get to hear about the day from another point of view. Presumably this was penned as a classroom exercise and Howland saves it. So the student repeats some of the same elements that Emily noted, the flowers, how the woman recounted losing her children, but we also get more. We learn what Nellie was wearing, that her husband was also present, that Emily read to them from the Bible. And sure enough, Margaret appears on that list of students. A collection like the one that we have here is really powerful because it contains these kinds of puzzle pieces that start to come together to show this bigger picture. A list, a letter, a school essay. Together we get a sense of what Howland was doing in this highly contentious school for black girls, who the, some of the students were, and just a touch of what they were experiencing in writing. Now, if there's anything to know about Howland, it's that even if she wasn't perfect, none of us are, but when she committed to a cause, she did so with her whole heart. So when she started teaching in 1857, she kicked off a passion that she held on to dearly. In one of her letters later on, she got introspective and admitted, I am of no more value in a quiet life than a bell never suffered to ring. I fancy I feel very much as such an instrument of sound must when not on duty, a great dangling thing of no sort of use. So it should come as no surprise that when the Civil War broke out, Emily was not satisfied to sit on the sidelines. She turned her attention to work undergoing at contraband camps. And by early 1863, right about when this photograph was taken, she was firmly entrenched in camps around Arlington, Virginia and Mason's Island near Washington, DC. She organized relief uh, for physical needs like uh, appealing for clothing, food, housing and work arrangements. 
before once again turning her attention back to education and organizing teachers and schools for the refugees. She developed close friendships with others engaged in similar efforts, like Cornelia Hancock and Caroline Putnam, who helped found and lead schools for African Americans in Virginia during the same time period. Now, Emily's papers include these three small pencil drawings of building, buildings associated with the Holly School that Putnam helped run, likely sent in one of the many, many letters the two friends sent to one another for decades and decades following their initial transformative Civil War experiences. The collection also includes this class photo that was taken in 1907 and is inscribed Miss Putnam's School giving just some sense of the students that would have filled their classrooms. And what's totally crazy to me is that the Clements has a collection of Caroline Putnam's papers. And it turns out Emily Howland was here all along. I just didn't notice her. But I was noticing now. And while admittedly Howland's thinking was constrained, she was very much a wealthy white woman and her beliefs in racial uplift were certainly rooted in a kind of 19th century paternalism. She could also be incredibly forward thinking. Following the Civil War, Howland continued to work among freedmen's camps, but once those were disbanded, she purchased land to establish several schools for African American students, including the Howland Chapel School in Heathsville, Virginia, that would become a dominating presence in the rest of her life. Her letters in the collection document financial planning, construction of the school, building upkeep, and correspondence with local African American residents, like members of the Boyer and Talia Farrow families who wrote the two letters shown here. They collaborated with Howland intimately on the creation and management of the school, and she'd go for annual visits for the decades following. Now Howland, this is what's I think truly extraordinary, eventually deeds the land to the Black residents in 1869, with the intentions of it being, quote, a great check on the wicked wills of the old slaveocracy who let no wit of a chance to oppress escape them. So while Emily pretty firmly believed that she knew what was best for people in a way that feels a little bit tone deaf to our ears today. She also demonstrated this truly remarkable willingness to partner with Black communities and establish Black control over their own land and education. Now, while Howland ceded authority over the school in Heathsville, she continued to financially support upwards of 50 Black schools well into the 20th century, such as the Koalaga Academic and Industrial School for Colored Youth in Koalaga, Alabama, Salma University in Salma, Alabama, the Piney Woods Country Life School for training colored boys and girls in Christianity, character and service in Braxton, Mississippi, the Manassas Industrial School for Colored Youth in Manassas, Virginia, and the Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, among many others. Around 1913, when she was some 85 years old, Howland went on a tour of the South visiting many of these institutions that she supported. She's shown here, accompanied by her niece and leaders of the Koalaga School. In her papers, you'll find letters of thanks, calls for contribution, and correspondence with presidents and principals from a range of these Black schools. Howland also personally provided scholarships for individuals and seems to have had a particularly strong interest in supporting young Black women's pursuit of higher education and professional success. This really evocative and beautiful mid 20th century photograph is unlabeled. So it's a little bit of a mystery, but there's some speculation that perhaps it depicts the Heathsville, Virginia community in the 1940s or 50s when researchers really began studying Howland's legacy. While uncertain, the possibility of this is really intriguing to me, thinking about the afterlives of Howland's work on behalf of black schools and black led communities. The collection also reflects Howland's long-standing friendship with Harriet Tubman, who lived in nearby Auburn, New York. They document visits between the two, the effort Howland put into coordinating speaking engagements in a way that honored Tubman's preferences and comfort, and small details about Tubman's life, such as her tendency not to eat until after noon on Fridays, the hour when the Lord descended from the cross. 
Howland also put Tubman in touch with others who were interested in racial and gender reform, like Pandita Ramabai Sarasvati, a noted reformer from India who advocated for the rights of women, widows, and orphans. She visited the United States from 1886 to 1888, where she struck up a friendship with Emily. And the letters between Ramabai and Howland continue through 1895. They touch on women's rights, publications, speaking engagements, fundraising, plans for visits, the school Ramabai ran in India, and introductions to Howland's networks, including Harriet Tubman. All of which, to me, suggests the international and intersectional nature of Howland's interests. She was invested in Black freedom and education, as well as women's rights, and those areas of advocacy blurred at times. And boy, oh boy, was Emily active in the work to secure women's right to vote. From the 1870s on, where she was really in the thick of things, and the collection gives this incredibly rich view of just what that fight must have looked like on the ground. I mean, just look at this hand fan that like literally made me squeal with delight when I first picked it up. Keep cool and raise a breeze for suffrage. Yes. And if you flip it over on the other side, oh. The rose is red, the violet's blue, we want to vote as well as you, all in this little heart. Ugh, I just, it's the best thing. And can't you just imagine standing in a crowd listening to a woman give a suffrage lecture in the months leading up to the election day and just fanning yourself with one of these, right? Like how extraordinary is this moment that it lets you imagine? Or check out this beautiful illustrated broadside that has this colored, color-coded map of where American women had full or partial suffrage. You'll note Michigan colored in red for having secured the right for women's vote that year, yes. Or you'll see that also something like this poster advertising a lecture of Miss Minnie J. Reynolds, who is gonna talk about her experience living and voting in Colorado to spur New York voters to pass female suffrage in their state. And you'll notice interesting choice to underscore that Reynolds is not one of the window smashing kind, but noted for her intelligent and womanly methods. So however you feel about whether someone's exquisite womanliness is a selling point, the advertising ephemera that you find in the collection like this speaks powerfully to the very strategic choices suffragists were making to sway public opinion. In Emily's papers, you'll also find mock ballots helping people show what they're going to see when they go to polling places and not so subtly encouraging them to vote yes for women's suffrage. Or perhaps you'll find notes from far-flung friends sharing the good news of victories elsewhere, like this incredible telegram offering greetings from Colorado, the first state in the union to extend equal suffrage to women on November 9th, 1893. It's just letter after letter after letter after letter from the 1870s through the early 20th century, speaking to the extent of Howland's engagement in the effort until finally in 1917, we see this, a postcard postmarked November 7th, 1917 from Harriet May Mills, the president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association, celebrating the passage of suffrage in Howland's home state. Hurrah, hurrah, isn't it wonderful if we really have one? It looks that way now. Congratulations to you and to all you have done through so many years. We owe an unspeakable debt. Won't it be great to go to the polls next time? An unspeakable debt because Helen for decades at this point, had been leveraging her networks of reformers, putting her finances behind the cause, writing letters to senators, organizing lectures, and leaning all the way in to do what she could to secure this victory. It's humbling to think about. And all of this became really crystal clear to me with, through this photograph, one of my favorite things in the collection. It's incredibly rich. And it's labeled in Howland's hand, November 7th, 1917, the morning after the victory of November 6th. And it shows a group in what appears to be the Cayuga County Political Equality Club headquarters, where they'd been working leading up to the 1917 election. 
In the photo, you see plenty of votes for women posters, including one posted in the front window. You can see if you look in closely, it's like you see it in reverse because it's facing outward. You notice it's advertising in very bold capital letters, but also notice to the store on the opposite side of the street. It's a millinery store. So surely they're gonna see a sizable female clientele coming in and out. And you can just imagine them looking across the street and seeing this suffrage hotspot. You'll also see posters on the wall that give insight into how suffragists like Howland were leaning on gender politics with messages composed in the voice of children pleading, give mother the vote, we need it. Our food, our health, our play, our homes, our schools, our work are ruled by men's votes. Isn't it a funny thing that father cannot see why mother ought to have a vote on how these things should be? Think it over, subtle. Or this one, mothers prepare their children for the world. Let them prepare the world for their children. And I can't help but pause and just appreciate the presence of a mother with her young child on her lap. Notice the child's ruddy cheeks. This is November in New York. Or the fact that somehow, by some miracle, they kept both of the mittens and the hat on. You'll see the mother's smile and her gently crossed feet. It means a lot to me to see them there. A reminder that the posters are, mar are more than just propaganda, right? That actual mothers with actual children were present out in the November cold, making it happen. Now in the room, you also see some just good old fashioned patriotism. There is absolutely no shortage of American flags. There's even, and Abraham Lincoln making a, a, a presence known and a reminder that under a republic, the people rule. What are women? A valid question. But if neither tugging on gendered heartstrings or patriotic fervor does it for you, maybe a quip that what's sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose will help you realize that women's suffrage is in your best interest too. But if you're still unswayed, maybe appealing to some of your prejudices might help. The suffrage music, uh, movement wasn't perfect by any means. And these next two posters are a powerful reminder of some of the blind spots. Convicts, lunatics, and women have no vote for parliament, proclaims this British poster, leaning on knee-jerk reactions to classing this very respectable looking woman wearing graduation regalia um, amongst the incarcerated and mentally unwell. This other poster is partially obscured, but appears to be doing similar work, making you wonder who else made this list of unfavorables to compare against women to shock audiences into supporting suffrage. History is rarely neat and tidy. There's plenty to, to critique and learn from to celebrate, but also lament. This picture helps remind me of that constant both and nature of the past. The fight for suffrage was both inspiring and constrained, right? And we need to look all of it squarely in the face. But right at the heart of it all and all its messiness and glory was Emily Howland. Not just seated, satisfied looking in the front row, but also featured prominently in a portrait on the mantle, an unspeakable debt indeed. Now in the course of her work, Emily Helen developed a very close friendship with Susan B. Anthony, the one that basically everybody on this call knew, right? For good reason. And they're shown here together. The collection contains about five letters from Anthony to Howland. And I especially enjoy this next one. Scrawled on a sheet of National American Woman Suffrage Association letterhead, but notice that the paper is upside down. You can just feel how quickly Anthony was writing, how pressed for time she must have been. It doesn't matter, just get the letter out, right? It's a scrawl, she's going fast. But it calls to mind to me again, those children books that we used over earlier and how Susan B. Anthony dominates in our imaginations and historical narratives while folks like Emily remain poised behind the chair, right? 
there's something maybe about working at the national versus the state level or something about how celebrity gains its own momentum, how people have public personas and how causes just grow that somehow some folks are overshadowed and their stories are less told. But in the end, the very things that may have caused Helen to be less known have become some of my favorite things about her. More than the extraordinary things that she accomplished or the energy she poured into righteous causes, it's feeling for her as a person that makes me want to champion her story. Because most of what I've talked about today was done from her family home in Sherwood, New York. She moved back home in 1868 when her mother fell ill and she tended to her in her final illness. And then she really stayed. Now, Emily would travel. She would make visits to some of these schools in the South. She would make annual trips to Heathville, Virginia. She toured, she visited, she went on trips, absolutely. But mostly she was in Sherwood, keeping the household running after her mother's death, being a dutiful daughter, hosting luminaries and writing ceaseless letters. She had a really close relationship with her father shown here as they sit on the steps of their Sherwood house but it was a complicated one. As a young woman, he'd only allow her to spend a few months at a time going away to school. She always felt compelled to return back home to tend to her parents' health, that she somehow couldn't leave him alone, that she had responsibilities to fulfill that kept her tied down. I don't know about you, but that resonates more with me than any of the exceptional highlights we've been fawning over. I intuitively get that. I know how that feels, how the demands of home are paramount and beloved, but also they're just sometimes heavy. And this becomes especially clear when you read the single diary that came with the collection written in the early 1870s when Emily was at home. It had been a few years now since she'd returned from coordinating with Friedman camps, teaching and helping found that school in Heathville, Virginia, and being at home was weighing on her. Remember her earlier statement, I am of no more value in a quiet life than a bell never suffered to ring. And Sherwood could be awfully quiet, and she was unhappy. I rebel against the drudgery of my life, cannot get out of it. She wrote angrily about having to dust the blinds and wash the floor. She hated it. Mud is very deep. I wish I could feel happiness. I hate myself. Her diary makes me cry. I'm getting really sad just reading it because I love her. I'm so inspired by her, but she's hurting so much. I don't know what I do. It sinks away into the great ocean of housework and leaves not a ripple. Like, oh my God, Emily. Helen was, she was a deeply motivated woman. She labored tirelessly under difficult conditions. She was unafraid to sleep on rough mattresses, to go into war camps, to do the hard work. And now she was stuck at home, frustrated about not seeing the point of tending to domestic needs. She was hurting. And she was aware of some of the underlying tensions that were causing her pain. Here she sighs, I feel rather gloomy, <laughs> partly weather perhaps. Maybe it's from incompleteness, not quite equal to being left out and feeling as I do not like to. I think I shall conquer. I've had many a tussle with my hatefulness in this respect. A good many times I've been omitted where it seemed to me I belonged. I've had to see others reap where I had sown. One is not anxious to be conspicuous, but one likes recognition of one's good intentions or one's services or place. I mean, yeah, <laughs> who doesn't? But it's humbling to read this woman's papers, to page through her diary and see that even amidst what I feel is all of this evidence, box after box of a life well lived, there's sadness, frustration, and a deeply human struggle that this larger than life woman who I want children's books to be written about so I can teach my son about her just felt small sometimes too. Helen was sad 
the year she was writing this diary, in large part, I think, because of the death of this man. While the photo's unlabeled, I believe this to be a cyanotype of Edward Strange, a British man who emigrated to America, was incarcerated at Eastern State Penitentiary for larceny, and ultimately released when he fell ill with tuberculosis at 28 years old. One of Howland's friends and fellow activists reached out to her, a single woman with no children, to try and figure out where he could live and recover upon his release. Howland ended up taking her into her home in Sherwood and formed a powerful bond with him. She spearheaded his moral reform, became his nurse as his health declined, and eventually she arranged for his burial. Now, Howland never married or had children, but she admitted to having a really strong connection with Edward that reads to me quite maternal. And in the face of his death, there feels to be, once again, an unmooring as she has lost something that gave her life meaning. And she feels herself, again, stuck and unpurposeful. She not only wrote in her diary, but letter after letter after letter to her friends about Edward. And then upon his death, a long 20 odd page retrospective of his stay with her. The final page shown here bears some stains. Now, maybe it's just oil from a lamp or something, but the possibility that they were caused by tears hangs really heavily over my reading and shapes my reaction to her. I know that Emily was imperfect. Her papers demonstrate some real aspects of racial prejudice and classism that can be really gross. I do not valorize her unduly. She made mistakes, but I find her impressive and admit that it feels like I could never make an impact as large as hers. But something about believing these marks just might be tears or what it meant for her to say she hated herself in her diary makes me stop and remember she was just a person like me, like you, who made choices, who regretted some of them, and most of the time just felt like she wasn't measuring up. Now, Emily lived a long, full life, well beyond that sad year following Edward's death. And while the papers we now hold at the Clements are extraordinary in all the ways I've shared with you today, there's just one more aspect of them that I find particularly moving. We get what I think is the great privilege of tracking a life through the years, from her early involvement in abolition, to going to work in contraband camps and with freedmen, to supporting black education, to advocating for women's suffrage. And through it all, she ages. Her eyes strain, her hands hurt, the world changes around her. This might be my favorite letter in the whole collection. She's writing in 1908 when she's 81 years old and still facing this absolute deluge of correspondence. So she tries to speed things up by using a new typewriter, admitting her poor old thumbs weren't up to the task of holding the pen. And notice how flustered she seems when she admits, I think that a new ribbon is needed and I do not know how to place it, right? It's almost like you're like someone has a new phone and they're like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know how to send an emoji, but it's like, I'm trying really hard to stay connected. It's like this superhuman moment. You can see the extra spaces between some of the paragraphs, how the text is just like a little bit crooked, like the paper wasn't quite put in straight. You can see all of the corrections that she's made and the fact that some of the lines start to overlap a little bit, like something's gone akimbo. And it's just so beautiful. And at the very end, she huffs, my machine behaves badly. <laughs> and I just, it's just, so perfect. But what I love most about it, what I just love about this letter is that then she gets to the end of the page and you flip it over and she's reverted back to pen. It's like, ugh, she's just fed up with a stupid typewriter, right? Like, ugh. And she begins, my attempt at typewriting was made a week or more ago and is so wretched that it must have discouraged the continuance of my letter. Now I return to my old tool, the pen, though my hand rebels against the labor which has been too constant for it, or that member has lost its power. 
When I begin to write, my hand is so tremulous that my will can hardly control its movements. Gradually, it yields and moves on as easily as in younger days. This passage just makes my heart ache and makes me love Emily as a person, not a hero. Man, she gave it her best shot. She gave up. But she came back a week later and she finished it. She knew the ways her body made things difficult for her, but she faced it, she named it, and kept going regardless. This letter, more than anything else, makes me appreciate her resilient spirit. This, as much as anything, is the stuff of heroes in history books. Remember that fabulous photo of Howell in the morning after she saw her home state pass women's suffrage? That same day, she wrote a letter to her niece, and it reframes how I understand this picture. She shares that congratulations by phone and calls have varied my morning. I cannot feel the certainty that suffrage is one that my friends do. I feel as though I was receiving as proxy for the absent and gone before. It seems too wonderful to be true, and I am constantly expecting arrival of reports remanding us to our disfranchisement. Whereas before, I read her as triumphant, exuding the decades of women's work that brought them here. Now I see she was also heavy with the memory of those who did not live to see the day. Susan B. Anthony, right? That where I imagined delight, there was also a good deal of fear. And so I, again, also want to return to this image of a young Emily Howland taken in 1863. She had at this point completed her first years of teaching at Marchilla Minor School for Black Girls ne near DC and was just beginning her work amidst the contraband camps. Her activist life was really just kicking off. We know that she would spend the next six decades continuing her fight for freedoms, but I hope also, that all of us can now also pause to appreciate this clenched fist grabbing her skirt. There's a tenderness and power and what feels to me like a touch of anxiety. What do I do with my hands? What am I doing with my life that I think serves as a reminder for all of us that these remarkable women we celebrate during Women's History Month, that we study and write children's books about, were more than just their accomplishments. They were full people who doubted themselves, sometimes even hated themselves, who cried, who fought with the typewriter, but in the end did not give up. When Emily died, she was buried in her hometown of Sherwood, New York. Upon her gravestone, she wanted these words carved. I strove to realize myself and to serve. It's her choice of verb that I uphold for us now. She reminds us that it's in the striving, not the completing. We don't have to be perfect to make an impact. And even our heroes are allowed to be sad because as essential as the right to an education or the right to vote is, there's something vital missing if you can't show up in your own life or in the history books as your full self. So let's acknowledge her as a complicated, imperfect, powerful woman who kept striving. Purposes nobly fulfilled indeed. Ugh, I love her. She's amazing. Oh, and we all love her now too. So thank you, Jane. That was amazing. And you have many people in the chat urging you to write the children's book, P.S. I might just do it. Watch out. I just <laughs> Good. I hope you do. That would be amazing. Um, just a reminder, everybody, we're going to answer some questions. And if you have any questions, if you could put them in the Q&A section, and we'll get to those momentarily. I'm just going to take a little pause while we let all of that absorb and think about the questions. Uh, to do a couple of housekeeping announcements, including uh, reminding you that you will receive an email with the recording and resources later today. And now that you're signed up for the bookworm, you'll receive a 
reminder next month for the bookworm and then you can choose to watch it live again or to watch the recording and by the way you can tell all your friends and send those emails on to them um, so that they can uh, learn more about Emily Howland as well next month April 19th will be uh, hosting a professor of history at the University of Michigan David Hancock who is a frequent visitor to the Clements Library, both for his own research and uh, in bringing students. And he will be um, talking about um, William Fitzmorris, second Earl of Shelburne, um, and the end of enlightenment. So that's been his uh, longtime research project and uh, will enjoy hearing a lot more. I also would like to invite you if you're, especially if you're somewhere nearby and can stop by to see our exhibit uh, sometime in the next month. Uh, the Art of Resistance in Early America closes on April 5th. And in that exhibit, we have um, another woman that we can celebrate during Women's History Month, uh, Phyllis Wheatley Peters. We made an amazing acquisition of the first American edition of her book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. And we have launched an ambitious crowdfunding campaign to raise the $42,000 for acquiring this book. As with the papers of Emily Howland as well, purchasing historic materials often requires decisions to be made quickly and for the fundraising to happen after the item is at the Clemens. And so we hope that through um, crowdfunding, people can help us with that continuation of that work and that you can feel like you're um, a part of bringing these amazing materials uh, to a public institution. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode of The Bookworm, you can contact me or Ann Bennington, Bennington Helper. And we are always incredibly grateful to all of you for being part of this community and for your participation in the chat and in the questions. And we're delighted to see you every month. So thank you so much. All righty. Looks like we have some wonderful questions coming in. So let's start um, with Zoe's um, question about the sources of Emily Howland's finances. You know, how was she able to provide financial support to so many schools? My understanding is that it's inherited wealth. Um... So her family, as noted in that one picture of Sherwood, New York, was very well established. Um, and so a lot of the money uh, is done in, in some ways in partnership with her father while he's still alive. The, the purchase of the land, for example, in Heastville, Virginia, she writes and convinces her, her father to buy that land for her, right? So she's really kind of acting as a go-between between her family's wealth and these causes. And then um, I'm not sure of the specifics. It'd be interesting to look at, you know, a will or census reports, um, but she still has access to that wealth following her father's death. So I imagine she must've inherited some of it, um, you know, but she really is kind of a financial powerhouse. And then she becomes that, director of the bank so she's very financially savvy um and is making real choices about where she sends her money and is receiving it seems like she kind of gets annoyed sometimes like oh there's just so many letters and so many you know i'm sending like oh it's, it's a lot of that is you know kind of you know the the financial backing of some of this stuff is like real just day-to-day -day work to like coordinate you know so it's it's a really interesting one 
and I think a whole book could be written about how women's, you know, financial decisions and where the money comes from. And, you know, it's sometimes can be subsumed within male leaders of the family, but she was definitely the one spearheading and encouraging the, the investment in these, these schools and causes. Well, Cheryl has a sort of follow-up question to that and wondered if she had any siblings. She did. Yes. I think she had two brothers, but one shows up more prominently and she actually, because again, she never had children, but she develops a in very close relationship with her niece, Isabel, who becomes a reformer and activist in her own right. So it's this whole family legacy of, you know, her father is a very vocal abolitionist, um, you know, has that has their house as a station on the Underground Railroad. There's Emily then who kind of takes up the mantle and it's really Isabel, her niece following her that continues that line through. Um, I am not as familiar with her brother's story. They remain, I think, relatively close in the area, but, um, and he also is shows up in suffrage things, you know, and he becomes, a, I think, a politician and, and advocates in, the, in those realms too. Um, so it, it really is kind of a, a family affair. So it's not like, you know, any contention with her siblings about how are you spending the family's money? I think it, it very much is like a, a shared commitment and understanding and the value of it. I also feel like Emily was probably a very <laughs> convincing woman. <laughs> so uh, I'm not surprised that she was able to get the family behind her. Um, so in terms of caring for her parents in old age, I mean, it makes sense that then she's the one who moves home, but they were potentially nearby to, to help in some way. Yeah, you know, and I think because she was the unmarried daughter, there's, you know, the, the gendered expectation that she would be the one to take it up, um, you know, without a, a household of her own to manage that the family home becomes that for her. So it's it's kind of the, you know, the, the 19th century expectation that the daughter would be the one to take up that mantle. Right, right. Um so Dan has an interesting comment. He says, I have a letter from Frances Ellen Watkins Harper to Emily. Um, this was from a time when Harper was speaking on behalf of the WCTU. Uh, do you have any correspondence between them or any information about their relationship? And as a follow-up, what was Emily's position on temperance? Mm -hmm. I wish my memory was good enough to be able to say, ah, <laughs> yes. Uh, but what I can say is please shoot me an email with like the dates in which she's writing. And I am always excited for an excuse to go back to the papers and take a look. Um, so that's, uh, I have the, the boxes right at my desk here. I'd be happy to take a look if you shoot me an email or remind me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Emily uh, was very, temperance minded. Um, she was active, I believe, with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, you know, I, I really spotlighted her, her abolitionism, her work on uh, black education and, and women's suffrage, but those were by no means her only causes. Um, temperance was also important to her. Pacifism was also really important to her. You know, she speaks out against, you know, the Spanish American War about World War One. Um, she's very, you know, reform minded in lots of way and temperance fits within this kind of universe of the ways in which she's seeing how we might advocate for and, and shape the world into a, a more just and morally upstanding thing. Um, you know, so probably not as active as these other movements for her, but it's it's certainly within the realm of of what she would understand to be her purview of of things to support. Um so Pamela's wondering uh, a little bit more about any um, any other connections with specific figures that you might not have mentioned and any mentorship that she provided. It sounds like she was mentoring Isabella, but maybe there were others mentioned. Yeah, you know, there's, I wish I, I, wish I had more time to really do background research. So I'm, I'm, I'm letting this be an open invitation to all of you on this call and to spread the word. There, she has really interesting relationships with some Black women 
that she kind of takes under her wing. Like some of them are students that like come to live with her for a few years or that she helps get positions in other schools. And she continues to make references to some people for a long time. And I'm like, is, is this Sydney? who I think it is, it's, it's Sydney Boyer Talifiero, or maybe the other way, Sydney Talifiero Boyer, who I'm like, ooh, there's a deeper story here about their relationship and how she remains invested in this woman from Heathville, Virginia. And I think she keeps visiting and she references her. I think she's in the home, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's some other Sydney altogether. But there are a couple instances where, you know, she really spearheads and helps black women get educated and get positions and like remains friends with them there's a fabulous um photograph album at the um i think the smithsonian i think it's on display at the national african-american museum um of emily howlands and in there you will find a picture of sydney um along with a very early picture of, of harriet tubman and it's this very interesting way to think about like who is close to her and how you might find these little snippets of stories to try to tease out. Um, so there's some like lesser known names like that. And then others, you know, you get, I wouldn't call it mentorship, but more partnership with some of these women that last for decades. Like Susan B. Anthony, she travels with, they write together. Um, you know, there's, she absolutely is working coordination with her. You know, New York is a big Emily is mostly active in, in the New York scene, which obviously is important to Susan B. Anthony from New York. Um, so they have a close relationship. And then I think also there's a lot to be uncovered between the network of female friends that Emily grows up with and stays close to. So Caroline Putnam, Cornelia Hancock, these other women who found and lead schools um, are writing to each other for decades and decades and decades and supporting each other and, you know, complaining to each other about the roadblocks they face and Emily's providing financial support for them as they struggle. And, you know, so there's a real sense of kinship and female community that I think think is really important to all of them to continue in this really hard and, and very isolating work as they do this. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of different ways you can pull on those threads of who is she mentoring and who is supporting her and, and what does that look like to work towards a, a better world when that work feels really hard at times. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. And yes, everyone, um, we, uh, one of the reasons we love research fellows too is they have the opportunity to really dive into some of these questions further. So spread the word that that people should come here to do um, follow up work on Emily Howland and her networks. Um, so Kathy is asking, will this collection be digitized? And that is such a hard question to answer, Kathy, because um yeah we we it takes an amazing amount of time and resources to digitize collections and it's something where we are so excited every time we put something up on um on our platforms but we estimate that maybe 7 to 10%, and that's probably generous of the collections at the Clements are currently digitized. Um, so I don't know, Jane, do you have any other insight as to whether or not this one has made it on the list yet? I, I think there's quite a queue. There is um, quite a queue. <laughs> but I will say, you know, knowing what is important to our users, what people really want and need access to is something we take really seriously. And so, you know, letting us know how excited you are, um, you know, supporting our digitization program, you know, get, you know, letting us, letting us know that is, is helpful because we do take those things into consideration. Yes. Yes. And I know I've heard talk that moving Moving closer to the top of the queue is um, our 
uh, long time, much used uh, Weld Grimke papers. And so hopefully, um, hopefully those will make it up there sometime soon and Emily Howland can be on the list as well. Um, so that I don't miss it, I see in the chat that Tom asked if Emily uh, was related to the Howlands who came on the Mayflower. I have no idea. So Tom, if you find out, please let me know. <laughs> uh, I really haven't gone further back in time beyond Emily's father and grandfather. So um, there might very well be a, a much longer history we can puzzle out about this family and, and how they come to their belief systems and, and what's important to them. So I would, I'm excited to know more as, as people dig into her story. Right. Um, Cheryl is just wondering uh, if you can share a little bit more about the collection's history, who had it, how did it survive, where did we get it from? Yeah. Um, so we got this, uh, you know, it came to us last year um, and we purchased it from a dealer who it was consigned to him from a family member, a family who had the papers. Um, I think there's some interesting work that can be done trying to puzzle some of this out because Emily's papers have kind of dispersed a little bit. You'll find collections of her stuff in a couple different places. So I think at some point her papers have kind of dissipated a little bit. Um, so there's some inter, you know, institutional work that could be done to try to figure out that, that provenance story. What I think is interesting about our collection, and I didn't speak about it today, is that there's a whole section at the very end of like research notes. There were three historians really working closely with these papers, like working on biographies and working on different things about her, most of which never came to fruition. Um, but we have like their research note cards and some, some you know, reproductions of photographs that go to visit her house in the 1940s and take all these pictures of what the house looked like, um, transcripts of the things that they find and as they're going through the papers. And my sense is that at that point, the papers are still in family hands. And so I'm curious if maybe the family's like, here, you're working on a biography. Here's the papers. And if it maybe descended that way. So there's some interesting questions that we might look at what's in the collection and try to puzzle out some of those lines of where the papers were and who was using them and then where did they get saved and then where did they get handed down to. And each collection beyond the content of what's in it has its own history and own story of how it moves from one person to another. Um, and I, I think it would be a, a fabulously interesting thing to think about the different institutions that have her papers and how you can follow those lines back to Emily herself. Um, but at this point, it's it's a little bit still open to try to figure out some of those connections. Um, the, the last thing that I would say and that I really want to emphasize is that the individual who ended up selling the papers, and I mentioned this in the talk, and I just want to come back to it because I think it's a really powerful and beautiful thing. Um, you know, some of this is a financial market. We pay money and the, we get the materials, we buy them on the open market. But the person who sold these papers is using the proceeds to fund, um, you know, social programs in the name of a relative, Rita Marshall. And I don't know much about Rita, if anything at all. But what I think is really beautiful is that, you know, that this person was loved by the family and the, the money from how the purchase of our purchase of the papers is being funneled back into the community and, and kind of uplifting the advocacy work and the you know social programs that that Howland herself would have been deeply committed to. And, and just thinking about that line between acquisition of papers and family histories and the ongoing commitments that we all can share to um, uplifting and, and improving the, even in the, in the small ways, the world around us, I think is really an inspiring one to kind of draw to the forefront and remember as we think about how these papers made their way here. Thank you. Um, Ernie is wondering if you have more information about what causes her niece advocated for and um, if, if there's more known about her and maybe even in this collection. 
Yeah. Um, so her niece is Isabel Howland. Um, Isabel is very active in suffrage movements as well. So that is, I think, for from what I know of her kind of her primary concern. Um, unfortunately, I don't I didn't really follow her story following Emily's death very much. So I'm not sure, but I would expect that she did not sit on her haunches, you know, and so um it would be interesting to kind of figure out if Isabel's papers survive and if we can carry her story forward because Isabel and and how and Emily are like this right like they're traveling together Isabel is writing to other people on her aunt's behalf you know that she's spending a lot of time with her she shows up in like you know meeting minutes that the two of them are together so I, I feel like they they really had a very close personal and you know kind of professional bond that like this is the work that we're doing and so um I think it would be a, a fabulously interesting one to kind of draw Isabel to the forefront in the collection that we have and, and see what stories come after afterwards because um my impression is that she very much takes up the, the family mantle of not sitting quietly on the sidelines when you see something wrong that's great very cool well thank you everyone for such good questions it's always um that's always such a a, a great thing to to have that opportunity to answer your questions and jane thank you so much for this um amazing presentation i was so wowed by your reading of that photograph when we talked about it in the um, dress rehearsal. But today I am just, ooh, it gives me goosebumps every time I think about how much is in that photograph. Um, so it was a wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for joining us today on this Friday morning and have a great weekend. <laughs>